So let me introduce Saruti. Dr. Saruti Hokes works for the University of Maryland. He uh, is in the Department of Etymology, so he's going to give us uh, an update on some of the latest research and what he's been working on. So Saruti, thanks for being here. Here's your... Make sure they can hear you. Okay. Is it working? Okay. George, can you hear him okay? Okay. Thanks for, for okay, being here. Okay. Thank you. So as Jenny mentioned today, I'm going to talk about some other research I've conducted with respect to wheat corn and soybeans. It's going to be a very much of a rust job because I only got 30 minutes to cover three different systems. So let's start. So this is the outline. I'll start with a wheat study. Then I'm going to talk about a BT corn trial. And this is one con conducted by Galen. Then I'm going to go into some brown mowry stink bug research. I assume a lot of people want to hear about that. And I'm going to talk about insecticide screening trial, some cultural management technique. And then I'm going to finish off with some bio biocontrol work that I conducted in both corn and soybeans. So they should be receiving it. Jenny, did you give them the handout of the insecticide trial? Because that's the one I'm going to skip to, to save some time. Okay. Okay. So let's start out with the fungicide tests. Now my interest in this particular project developed because wheat have various aphid complexes. One of the things that can keep aphids in check is pathogens. Aphids, insects, they're vulnerable to pathogens just like humans are. And one of those tend to be fungal, fungal pathogens. They will come out and basically wipe out an aphid population just as well as any insecticide product you have. However, wheat is also susceptible to pathogens itself. There are plant diseases that attack wheat. And some other products that you use to suppress those wheat disease can also suppress these pathogens that are specifically for attacking insects. So one of my interests was if people use these products to try to keep their wheat clean of disease, would it have any sort of impact on these pathogens that attack aphids? But one of the things I determined is early on when I started studying this system that aphid had another natural enemy out there. And these are parasitic wasps. These are small wasps that will go in and lay their eggs inside of the body of an aphid. When that egg hatched, basically it eats the inside of the aphid, killing it. So I found that these guys were doing such a good job that these pathogens never develop. Because for these pathogens to attack aphids, they need a, a large population. They don't waste their time if there's only a small population of aphids. So instead, I said, well, I'll still look at these products. And my interest was seeing how these products will impact aphids, other pests such as the cereal leaf beetle, um, also predators, would they have an impact on predators, natural enemies out there. Uh, wheat disease, and then to also yield, which is irrelevant, also relevant. So the products I decided to use were Headline, Tilt, Warrior, which is a pyrethroid, and then there was a check. And the check, of course, didn't receive anything. You just got a good speak about the, uh, speech about the importance of checks. And then these pesticides were applied during a normal period where you apply to your wheat to protect it from d diseases. And then I looked at both insects, pests, and beneficial, and to a lesser extent, I also monitor disease pressure, because two of the products I use are fungicides, although I'm an entomologist. And then we would count the number of orthopods that we found in those systems. We were focused on aphids, and we used three different techniques of monitoring these insect population. We used direct counts, where we actually would pull up wheat and count the number of insects there. We use yellow sticky cars. These are cars that will catch flying insects. And then we also use sweep net. Now I want to start off by showing some of the data that we found with respect to the aphids. Here on the x-axis, these are the various sampling dates. We started sampling that wheat field from April 24th, we completed May 30th. And that is the mean number of aphids aphids. Now aphids aphid mean wingless aphids. There are two types of aphids. You have the wing type, you have the wingless type. Typically the highest population are the wingless ones, so that's what we're going to focus on. And then we have our four treatments here. This was at the Beltsville site. The check received no chemical application at all. And then the one the line representing the yellow is the one that received the headline. Orange received tilt. And then the triangle, blue triangle there received warrior. Now this green arrow is just to indicate when those products were applied. That was around May 13th. And basically around April 24th, the initial day that I went out there sampling, those parasitic wasps were already active. They were already attacking those aphids. And you can see they sort of just drove that population down. Now, when we applied that warrior, which is that pyrethroid, you can see you got a flat line there. But it didn't matter because all of them were flat lining because of those natural enemies were already doing a good job. We look at the upper Marlboro site. Same thing. Started sampling April 24th. 
May 31st was the last day. Pretty much the same thing. The population at April 24th is typically when aphid population should be really high because they seem to be more cold tolerant than natural enemies. But those parasaurs was already out there knocking that population and then basically it just kept that population down. Again, you can see when we applied that warrior, May 13th, it flatlined, but it didn't matter because all those treatment was flatlined. So those natural enemies are already doing a good job out there. The second interest was looking at this cereal leaf beetle. And one of the ways we monitor cereal leaf beetles was looking at the flag leaf. Of course, the flag leaf is very important with respect to you, right? So we wanted to determine how many of those flag leaves showed extensive damage by the cereal leaf beetle. And extensive damage is this feeding here. So we looked at a total of 100 leaves randomly in each of those plots, and then we determined the percentage of those leaves that showed this extensive damage from cereal leaf beetle feeding. Again, this was focused on the flag, flag leaf. And basically, this is the results we found. Not a whole lot, not a whole lot of damage. We can see in the Beltsville site, it ran from 13 to 15 percent. No significant difference in any of those treatments. But then if we look at the Upper Marlboro site, we can see that the check treatment that didn't receive anything had significantly more damage at 26%. Well, I still find this interesting because these products here, these are fungicides. They shouldn't really have an impact on the cereal leaf beetle, so I'm not sure what went on there. The other thing I did was look at disease rating. I'm also happy that Arv isn't here to see me say this. And one of the ways we did this is basically we went to that flag leaf and we we sampled 100 leaf at randomly, and we counted the number of leaf spots per flag leaf. And this shows the results. Again, this is both Beltsville and Upper Marlboro. And basically what we found is that we did get some, some help out from using those fungicides. We can see here in the check plot that received nothing and the plot that received warrior. Again, warrior is just insecticide. We can see the number of leaf spots per leaf averaged around four. And here, a headline and tilt, we can see it significantly lower. The highest been headline at one. And in the upper Marlboro, disease pressure was a little bit lower, but similar results. We found a number of leaf spots were highest in the check and the warrior. And here, we didn't get much um, leaf spots. So those fungicides worked pretty well in doing the job. Other thing I was interested in, will these products have an impact on those predators? Remember, the predators are the ones that are out there keeping those aphid population in check. They're suppressing them. And basically what we found here, we, we did this sweep net sampling at May 25th. I'm just showing what happened at May 25th because the products were applied on May 13th. And basically what we see is per 20 sweep, check, headline, and tilt was pretty good at about four natural enemies per 20 sweep. But look what happened to warrior plot. This is that pyrethroids. And that's the thing about pyrethroids. Pyrethroids are known. They're very harsh on natural enemies. And in some instances, you have you can apply pyrethroids and you actually get an outbreak of a secondary pest because it relieves that secondary pest of their predators and then they explode. So the next thing was, the final thing was, that was all good, but what about yield? The final thing was to look at the yield. And based on what we saw at the Beltsville, whether we applied those products or not, the yield was pretty similar. Look at Upper Marlboro, the same. And I circled this, and the reason why I circled this, if you could remember s several slides back, this check plot, these check treatment plots is up at Marlboro. They had the highest incident of damage leaf from the cereal leaf beetle, and they also had the highest incidence of disease. But still, despite that, the yields were similar to these other ones. So basically, to summarize that, what we found was the use of headline, warrior, or tilt did not result in a yield increase in the check treatment plots at Beltsville, Upper Marlboro. And I did this study two years ago, too, and I found very similar, uh, very similar findings. So this suggests to see a yield increase, you have to get these products. It will require a much higher disease or insect pressure. Second, if pest levels are high and you still get that yield boost, you still have to take into consideration the cost of using that product. What's the yield high enough to make up for the difference? Now let's switch over to BT corn. And this was a study that was done by Galen Dyla and Terry Patton. So I first want to start out with a definition of what is GMO. And GMO is an organism whose genetic material has been altered to have a desirable trait. 
Sometimes they stick that gene into the plant to make it toxic to an insect. They may stick a gene in a plant so you can go out there and use a, a herbicide to make that plant tolerant to it. But that's what GMO is all about. So a little history. Initially, when people started working out with GMO crops, they, had, they didn't have a lot of ambition. They would stick only one gene into a plant. Maybe that one gene was just to make that plant toxic to an insect. Or they stuck in that one gene to make that plant tolerant to a herbicide that they can go out and use. Then they started getting more fancy. They increased the number to two genes. Maybe one gene to make the plant toxic to insect and another gene to make that plant tolerant to a herbicide. Now the newest GMO products, they stick in a lot of genes. They stick in multiple genes to make it toxic to different insects. And also to make it tolerant to two different types of herbicide, like the glyphosate and the ignite. Here are a few examples of that. The triple pro, they stuck in two genes, two BT genes to make it toxic to caterpillar. Then you have the Roundup 2 trait. Then you have the Victiro. They stuck in two genes to make this plant Toxic to insect, and then you have the Roundup Ready gene. Now look at the Smart Stack. The Smart Stack, I call that the granddaddy of all GMO crops. Eight genes inserted into that plant. Three to make it toxic to caterpillars. Three to make it toxic to rootworm. And look at there, two for herbicide tolerance, glyphosate as well as Ignite. So with all these genes in the plant, you expect to get some benefits. What are some other potential benefits? Better control of the old fall armyworm. The early, the early generation BT genes, they did good for European corn borer, but they didn't do anything with respect to fall armyworm control. Also, corn earworm, these newer ones with these multiple genes, you can stop that corn earworm from feeding because it will kill them. And now, you're about to get everything you need in the bag. Now, I know everyone here, when you plant your BT corn, you plant that 20% non-BT. Everyone does that, right? I'm sure everyone does that. So you have to go out, you, you buy your corn with the BT, and then you buy separate bags of the non-BT. But now what they're going to do is put everything in a single bag. So now you can go, when you buy that BT corn, within that bag, it's going to be your 20%. So now you don't have to go out and buy it separate. Also, you get to choose between classes of herbicides. Now they're having these ones with both the Roundup Ready gene and the Liberty Leak gene. So you can choose which herbicide you want to use. And as covered by the mute button, the end results, if you get less insect damage, you're going to get better yield, right? So Galen had an idea. He said, I'm going to test the old GMO products. These are the ones with that single BT gene, although they may have that herbicide gene, with the newer GMO technology, ones with all these genes inserted, mainly multiple BT genes. And he wanted to look at the impact on caterpillar feeding damage and also corn yield. So we're going to start off first by showing this caterpillar feeding damage. Now, this graph is really messy, but we can make it quite simple. So first of all, he did this at two different locations. This represents the Y, Western Maryland. I should say Western Maryland. This was done in Beltsville. The blue represents Beltsville. This represents, uh, I think that's Y. And then the red represents Les Rex, which is Salisbury. So to make it simple, because the highest insect pressure was at Salisbury, try to zero out everything except these red bars. Let's focus on these red bars. Now what I've done here is this red box, this outline, these are the ones with the single BT gene. Again, single BT gene. The blue box, these are the ones represents the one with multiple BD, BT genes. And, and I actually put the genes out here. And then also we have here the non-BT hybrid. No BT gene insert. And basically what this shows is the amount of kernel area consumed per ear. So basically what he did was he went into a different treatment, he peeled back that husk, and he, they estimated the percentage of that ear that was eaten by, in this particular instance, the pest was the corn earworm. So basically it stands right out here. These are single genes. Look at how much was eaten versus these multiple genes. So you can see a lot less damage done there, a lot less feeding damage. And you can also tell which genes were responsible for it. We can tell that these two genes here were responsible for it. Because you see this 1F here, it didn't add anything to it. And also you look at here 1F, a lot of feed. And that's because that gene is to target the fall armyworm. The corn earworm was the pest here. So we didn't, that's what you expect. And then with this Vipterra, you can see it's the Vip3A. This is the gene that's really 
controlling that corn earworm. You can see here 1AB didn't add anything to it. Here you got a lot of feeding damage. So the next thing was, what about yield? And let's take a look. Again, in the red here, single products, the blue, the multiple genes, and then the non-BT hybrid. Now, what happened? That separation is gone now. You see these bars out here, these red bars? They're all pretty much the same. So you got good, got good feeding damage. I mean, you reduced that feeding damage, but you didn't get good yield. And the other thing to point out is, look here. Remember the smart stack. The granddaddy of them all, eight genes. Look at that yield, 138.1 bushels per acre. Look at the non-BT hybrid. There's actually no significant difference between those two. They're practically the same, and that's indicated by that letter D. And this is actually an average of, I think, maybe eight or so non-BT cultivars. When I took a look at Galen data, I actually saw there were some non-BT hybrids that yielded higher than the smart stack. That's because they have that tight husk. You know, when that corn earworm is trying to get in, if that husk is tight, they have a difficult time. So tight husk, non-BT tight husk, can also help prevent that corn earworm from penetrating. So I showed that, that slide, many slides back, I talked about the potential benefits of these multiple genes, but I have to break out some of the potential negative aspects of the pitfalls of using those. It's one, as thrown from that previous slide, you don't always get that yield boost. Second, it's gonna cost you extra money. Then third, you may be paying for genes that you don't need, rootworm. Remember, if everyone is rotating properly, you won't have a rootworm problem. And I, and this is, if you get nothing away from this particular talk on BT, this is the one thing I want you to take home. Rotate. The last thing you wanna do is be forced to buy these products with that rootworm gene in it because you didn't rotate and you created a rootworm problem. It's easy to prevent a rootworm problem, but it's harder once you get it to get rid of it. So I say rotate non-host crop to try to keep that rootworm problem from occurring. So basically, we found that although newer generation GMO corn may provide better insect control, yield struggle and additional costs may make it economically less feasible for use under certain conditions. And I say under certain conditions. Maybe if you have really, really intense high insect pressure and you get a lot of feeding on that non-BT product, then you may start to see some yield advantage of using some of these multiple genes. So let's quickly move on to something else, brown moraine stink bug. And this is what most people bring me in to talk about, but I don't want to be known as the stink bug guy, so I always try to throw in some other stuff. <coughs> so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. One, I'm, I'm going to try to rush, and um, it's impossible for me to get us back on time schedule, but I can get it. But anyway, what you have there is a handout. Jenny hand you a handout. And this handout is some work done by Tom Kuhar. And it's a bioassay study. And basically what it does is he spray these different bean plants with these different insecticides, the same rate that he would use in a field experiment. And then he, he let these leaves dry and he introduced brown marmot stink bug nymphs as well as adults. And then he looks at mortality. And in general, a lot of times we don't like the bioassay works because a lot of times it doesn't match up with what you see in the field. But this technique is pretty, is pretty good. The results that he tend to get in his lab is pretty similar to what he found out in the field. And I'm not going to go on the results, but I will summarize a few things from that sheet. One is that some of the lab and field tests suggest that specific pyrethroids and some of the neonicanoids provide pretty good control over the brown marmot stink bug. The other thing you will find is that some of the older pyrethroids don't work as well. The older ones, if you see some on that sheet that's surrounded by that little box, that are some of the older generation pyrethroids. We also find that some pyrethroids may cause secondary pest flare-ups, especially if you have a brown marmot stink bug problem and you have an aphid problem. If you use these pyrethroids, they may knock out your brown marmot stink bug problem, but you may have these tremendous aphid flare-up. And that's because they knock out those natural enemies. Aphids reproduce much more faster than these natural enemies can um, catch up. We also find, you will see that on that sheet, it's separated by mortality due to nymphs and adults, and you will find that these insecticides are far more effective on the nymphs than the adults. In some instances, they smoke the nymphs 100%, but with respect to adults, you maybe only get 20, 30% control. And then you also have on that sheet, there's two products that have an X, and that's because those products are being phased out by EPA, so they're not gonna be on the market much longer. Thynex is one of those that were very effective too, and that was going to get phased out. 
Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about cultural management, very little bit about cultural management. Cultural management for the brown market stink bug. And we think that one of the things that you could try to do, if it's possible, is to try to plant your field away from high-risk area. And what do we mean by high-risk area? High-risk areas are those places where they're overwintering. Places where they're overwintering, they're going to come out of overwintering. The first plant they hit, that's where they're going to land. So we call these high-risk areas. So last summer, I had a graduate student, and, and her interest was she went to these different cornfields, and basically she was looking at different habitats outside the cornfield. Her interest was seeing how do habitats outside the cornfield impact the number of brown marmot stink bug as well as local stink bugs that she find on the corn plant. So she went to cornfields that were surrounded by woods. She went to cornfields that were surrounded by road. Um, and I have houses there, but that's actually buildings. This could be barns, empty warehouses, as well as homes, and then cornfields that were surrounded by other crops. And basically what she found was that those cornfields that were neighboring empty buildings tended to have the highest number of brown marmot stink bugs per corn plant, and woods, and also crops, and those fields neighboring roads didn't have as many. The interesting thing about these empty buildings, though, is although she found that there was a higher number per plant, they dropped off. Once you got about 20 feet, 30 feet into that cornfield, you couldn't find a stink bug. But with these other habitats, you could go in at least 50 feet and you could still find them. So I found that very interesting. So now I'm going to move on to biocontrol. Now, with biocontrol, Biocontrol is basically looking at natural enemies, whether this can be predators or whether this be wasps that lay their eggs inside of the host body, or pathogens. That's one of my interests. And there's three strategies you can use. One is importation. Now, importation is the strategy that they would specifically use for brown marmot and stink bug. And the reason is this is a zotic insect, a zotic pest. When a zotic pest comes into a region with all these natural enemies, there's a chance there's nothing there that can successfully bring it under control. So this importation also called classical biological control. What they do is they go back to the native country where this pest existed and they find some natural enemy there and bring them back. And that's the idea. Then augmentation. Augmentation biocontrol is a little bit different. You have a natural enemy here, you have some that can successfully attack that pest, but the numbers may be low. So basically what they do is they augment them, they mass rear them, maybe in a laboratory, and then release them in the field, and then let them bring that pest under control. And then conservation. Conservation is one of the areas that I work on. Conservation is basically you're trying to reduce a factor that interferes with that natural enemy. For instance, if you have an insecticide that you're using, and it's very hard on one of these natural enemies, maybe you try to use another insecticide. Another one is just trying to make the habitat more conducive for their longevity for their life, make them more comfortable, make them live a little bit longer. And that's sort of my area. So basically, because everyone grows cover crops, my interest was in seeing if I could use cover crops to try to increase the activities of these natural enemies and help see if they could help bring this brown marmot and stink bug under control. So I did a couple of studies last summer, one being in field corn and another one being in soybean. So I start off with the field corn study. And this was the method. I planted the cover crops in the fall, which is typically what everyone do. They plant their cover crops in the fall. But then the second step, the second step is when I did things a little bit different. Instead of burning down that cover crop, we planted the corn directly into the standing cover crop. We never burn it down. We planted it directly into that standing cover crop. And then before the corn plants got too tall, then we went in and we flail mold that cover crop. So that's how we control it. We flail mold. We killed it that way. And part of that reason was because a part of this study was also trying to get good weed suppression. One of my graduate degrees is in weed science, so I always try to throw that in whenever I can. And then after we flail mold it, we started taking the data. And the cover crops I decided to work with was crimson clover, leguminous cover crop, and then I also worked with rye. And then I made up my own stack. I did a crimson clover and rye mix. And then my check was a no cover crop treatment. Of course, we got those winter annuals that came in, but we had to clean those up. So results, before I go to that insect data, I want to make a quick detour and, and show some of what we found with respect to weed suppression. Now, this particular 
table shows the percent ground covered by weeds in that no-till corn study. Under those different treatments, remember we have to check the crimson clover, the rye and rye crimson clover mix. So basically what we did was 15 days after that corn was planted, I went out with a sprayer and I sprayed an eight inch strip of Roundup directly over the corn row. That's it, eight inch strip directly over the corn row. And then we went in there and we started looking at the percentage of ground that was covered by weeds. Basically by 30 days after plant, about 78% of the ground in that check was covered by weeds and in crimson clover rye, the highest was at 3%. So we can see here, basically, this was gonna take over. That corn plot was gonna be taken over by weeds. So basically what I had to do is go back in, just to check plots, just to check plots, and spray that entire, those entire plots with herbicide. These other ones, I never touched them other than that eight inch strip, 15 days after plant. And you can see we went in 50 days and then 90 days, and the highest we got was around 5% in the crimson clover at 90 days. But at 90 days, that corn is so tall, 5% weed cover, it's not going to do anything. Now let's switch back to insects. So my, again, my interest was determined, determined if, if that manipulation of that cover crop, what kind of impact it will have on brown marble stink bug mortality, mainly through the activity of natural enemies. So here we go. I focus my attention on the egg stage. So why focus on the egg stage? The egg stage is the weak length of their life cycle. Parasitoids can come in and lay its egg inside and kill it. The egg can't fight back. You can have predators come in and chew on this egg. It can't fight back. Sucking predators with these needle-like mouth parts will go in and stick it in there and suck the contents. The egg has no defense. But with respect to the brown marmot stink bug, the older that insect gets, the less likely there's going to be predators out there or natural enemy that can successfully attack it. So I consider the egg stage the weak link. So basically in the back here is the corn plots and basically we did, we went through those different corn treatments and we looked for brown marmot stink bug eggs. When we found an egg, we would mark that egg mass. Then we allowed that egg mass to stay out there 48 hours. Then we bring it back to the lab and when we brought it back to the lab, we sort of were looking for things. We wanted to know how many of those eggs were eaten by predators, whether it's chewing predators or sucking predators. How many of those eggs were attacked by parasitoids? And I remind you, parasitoids are very small wasps. And what these wasps would do is they would land on these eggs, they would overposit or lay their own egg inside of that egg. When their egg hatches, it basically eats the inside of the brown marmot stink bug egg, killing it, comes out, they mate, feed, and the cycle starts again. And we also have some unknown mortality. Unknown mortality simply means the egg didn't hatch, but we're not, we're not sure why and then the percent that actually hatched into nymphs. So let's show, look over that data. I think we found a total of 923 eggs in total, of those 923 eggs. And then we have our different treatment, remember? This was corn planted in the rye plus crimson clover, corn planted in crimson clover cover crop, corn planted in the rye, and corn planted to bare ground. And these are the total number of eggs we found in those different treatments. So the blue represents the percentage of those eggs that successfully hatched into brown marsh stink bug nymphs. The white represents the percentage that were eaten by predators. This yellow or gold represents the percentage that were parasitized. And the gray represents the percentage that due to unmo unknown mortality, death due to unknown mortality. And basically you look here, the blue represents the percentage that hatched. The brown marsh stink bug didn't do very well in any of those treatment plots. But if you look at this closer, I did find some interest in here. I know Bob says don't use rye, but, <laughs> but I found some good results here with the rye. Look at here, where we had this rye plus crimson clover and this rye, look at that parasitization rate, 72%, 70%. I remind you, that's due to wasps. And I've seen a lot of brown marmot stink bug parasitoids data that people have presented, and I've never seen it this high before. I haven't seen it this high with the local stink bug population. And I should mention here this unknown mortality. This unknown mortality here could be due to parasitization. You know, sometimes a parasitoid may lay an egg in it and that, and that parasitoid doesn't successfully develop, but it still may kill the egg. And it's the same thing with predators. Remember I said some of these predators have sucking mouth parts. They're very needle-like. They can stick it in that egg and maybe take some of the content out, causing that egg to not hatch, and maybe we miss the injuries. So this unknown mortality could still be due to natural enemy activity. Now, let's switch over to soybeans. I did a very similar 
study with soybeans, trying to see if we could use cover crops to increase the mortality on brown marmot stink bug. The method was pretty much dissimilar, except step two. Step two here is the only thing that was different from corn. Remember in corn, I said I planted the corn directly into the standing cover crop. With soybeans, we initially flail mowed it first, and that's because I didn't feel the soybean would do good if we try to plant it directly into the standing cover crop. And then at that point is when we started taking data. And I also used different cover crops. For this one, I used barley. And I used this new one that I was interested in testing out. And this is Australian winter pea. This is a legumeless cover crop. It produces a lot of biomass. And that was one of my interests in it. Because of that biomass, I thought I could also get good weed suppression with that one. And then I did my mix, the Australian winter pea, legume, and the barley mix. Now for this one, I, I used a, a few more categories in looking at that mortality. But it's the same here. X axis represents the fate of those eggs. The only thing I should mention is that in the previous when I talked about corn, I talked about total number of eggs. Now these represent egg masses, egg masses. So in each egg mass, there's an average of 25 to 26 eggs. So if you take this number here and you multiply that by 25 or 26, that's the total number of eggs that we found. Now, basically what we find here is, again, we have our um, four treatments, the soybean plant and the Australian winter pea barley mix, the barley and the Australian winter pea, and then there was the no cover crop check. Again, we have out here, the white represents the normal hatch. The normal hatch, again, you have like 25 to 26 eggs per egg mass. Normal hatch means pretty much they all hatch out. Then I had another category here, which I call low hatch. Now, low hatch means we had, again, on average, 25 to 26 eggs. Low hatch means only maybe five of those successfully hatched. In most instances, it was no more than two or three. We had another category we call missing. Kind of an interesting category. We will find the eggs. We go out the next day to monitor the fate of those eggs, disappeared from the plant. Not because they hatched, just simply disappeared. So we don't know if there's some predator out there who will go and eat the eggs and absolutely leave nothing behind. We're not sure what's going on there. Then we had another category where we call um, chewing predators. And then here is represents sucking predators. And then here is parasitization. Now, the predator that was most responsible for the mortality was the sucking predators. Because here, it represents yellow. But this here, where we call low hatch, that low hatch was actually due to sucking predators. The sucking predators would go through and maybe wipe out most of the egg and leave just one and two. So it's a little bit different than what we saw in corn. In corn, the mortality was mostly due to parasitization. In soybean, we had it due to sucking predators. And there's probably a reason because of that. And that's because these sucking predators will feed on parasitized eggs. So in many instances, I know the eggs are parasitized because when a wasp lays its eggs in that, in that brown marmot stink bug egg, the egg starts to turn a grayish, blackish color. And I will see that. But then sometimes a predator will come along and feed on that egg. So in the end, when I do the mortality, I have to give the mortality to the predator. The other thing I noticed was, remember several slides back when I showed that rye, wherever that rye was, we had that high rate of parasitization? We saw a similar thing here with the barley. Another grass cover crop, and look at the rate of parasitization, 20 around 19.3 and 14.3. <laughs> compared when it wasn't there, 6.1 and 6.8. So it seems to be something going on with these grass cover crops and that parasitoid that seemed to be more active in these grass cover crops. Now the question is, who are responsible for attacking those brown marmot and stink bug? And I'm only going to show a few of the natural enemies. One being this insect here. This is called Geochorus. It's called the big eye bug. And the lighting is not very good, so you can't see it very well. But this one is known to be in soybeans. This one I happened to catch on a pepper plant. And basically what, what we have here, this is a first instar brown marmot stink bug nymph. The ones that just come off the egg. And then it has here, it has a very needle-like mouth part, because this is one of the sucking predators that is stuck in there and basically sucking the content. Now when I looked underneath this plant, guess what I saw? Another one with a brown marmot stink bug nymph in its mouth. So I thought this was a little strange. But when I looked further back in that leaf, what I saw was there was an egg mass. There was an egg mass that was just hatching. So basically what these guys were doing, they was going to that egg mass and picking these guys off like they were red M&Ms and just eating them. 
And the other thing about this one is that it would also feed on the eggs. It feeds on the brown marsh stink bug eggs also. So feed on the eggs and, and the first instar nymph. We also found jumping spider. This is a jumping spider. And this is mouth. This is probably maybe a third instar nymph. But we found spiders will also feed on the eggs. They will go after the eggs. We found them in corn, soybeans, and we found them on other plants. So the spiders are very good. Mainly the jumping spiders. Now, with respect to parasitoid, what we found with this little guy here, this little guy here, or I should say girl, was most responsible for that parasitization we saw. And when it lands on the egg mass, basically it will go through and parasitizes every single egg. It doesn't miss an egg. It parasitizes every single egg. And then she sits there, and I tell people, they sit there like, once they finish, it's like they're taking a dump on the egg. But actually, what they're, they're not really taking a dump on the egg. They're just squatting. And the reason why she does that is that, say if she parasitized these eggs and leave, another wasp could come along and parasitize those eggs. And that wasp may outcompete her eggs. So she has to sit there like she's taking a dump and basically guard those eggs. Now, once they start to develop enough in size where another parasitoid can't come and lay eggs, then she will leave. And I just want to show this picture. This is actually a local stink bug egg. And you can see this sort of grayish, blackish color. That's what I mean. When they're parasitized, that's what happens. And here you can actually see the opening here. This is one way the parasitoids have already chewed their way out. So basically what we found is some good news. Remember I said this was a exotic pest. And sometimes when you have an exotic pest comes from another country, natural enemies, local natural enemies, don't move on, start attacking it. But in this instance, what we're seeing is that we have some local natural enemies here. The ones that were mainly keeping the local stink bugs in check are moving on and attacking this guy. I do need to do more research to better quantify what these cover crops are having. Especially, I need to find out what it is about these grass cover crops that is increasing the rate of parasitization. And also, in future studies, I want to look at flowering plants. And the reason why I'm interested in flowering plants is because some of these parasitoids, they feed on the nectar of flowering plants. So my interest is if I can put these flowering plants along the borders of some of these fields, can we increase the activity of these um, natural enemies? And again, this is what we call conservation biocontrol. You're trying to bring something there that helps the natural enemy out. And with that, I need to acknowledge the Maryland Grain Producer Utilization Board. They funded the BT corn work as well as the um, corn brown marsh stink bug work. Um, also got some funding from USDA to help me with that corn work. And then the Maryland Soybean Board, they helped fund that um, soybean work. And then also Galen for sharing his uh, BT, um, BT data with me and then my two colleagues. I didn't show all their data. And then a bunch of student help who helped contribute to this project. And I think that's it. And I know we're running out of time, but I will be around for lunch. So just grab me at that time and you can ask all the questions you like. <laughs>